What is up everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission and this week in the Word we're going to be taking a look once again at how all the new versions reduce the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the last week we'll be doing this subject so hopefully it's good for you. Grab your Bible, let's jump in. Back to the channel folks glad to have you here uh, this week we are going to be concluding our study and how the new versions of the Bible all reduce the deity of the Lord Jesus we're not done looking at the new versions of the Bible and seeing the differences but this topic reducing the deity of Jesus is a very important topic to me I went into depth in it even though I didn't give anywhere near the amount of examples I could. I did hit a number of examples. I think between the couple videos that we've done now, there's probably somewhere around 10 and 20 examples of, of just that alone. This week, we are going to be looking at some scripture. I'm gonna give this to you in advance, so if you wanna write it down, you can, uh, but that way you can flip along with your Bible and uh, compare apples to apples here. Uh, Philippians 2, 6. Acts 7:45, Matthew 6:13, and then Luke chapter 4 and verse 4 and verse 8 are what we're going to be looking at in this particular study. Now, as I ask every week, if you have a story of encouragement you'd like to send out to the brothers and sisters through this channel, or just something you'd like to praise God over, or a testimony of your faith, please send us an email at tinylifebigmission at gmail.com, that's our email address, and uh, we'll read those on the air here, and hopefully you can be a support to some of the other people out there that may be struggling with something, or maybe um, just need a little bit of encouragement, or can rejoice in, in the fact that you've given your life to the Lord. So without further ado, we'll go on ahead and jump into this week's study. I hope it blesses you, and uh, enjoy. We're now going to look at the next way that the new versions of the Bible reduce the deity of Jesus. Uh, look to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 is going to be our text, but I'm going to read through verse 11 in the King James just to give you some context. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This compares to some of the scripture that we talked about earlier when it was talking about the first Adam and the second Adam and how the first Adam the Lord came from heaven and it said that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that God, that he is God. This verse is a connecting verse to those verses as well, where it speaks to every knee bowing and every tongue confessing. And the reason why is because Jesus Christ is equal to God. And that's not even the point that we're going to drive at. I just am giving you that a little extra for free. So if you don't like it, I'll give you a refund. First question I'm going to ask you in this is, was Jesus a man? Yes, Jesus was a man. Was Jesus also at the same time God? Yes, Jesus was also God. And before we jump into the versions as well, it says in here, Wherefore God hath all also highly exalted him, and hath given him a name which is above every name. What name do you suppose it was that God gave him here? Do you think it was the Word? Because God magnified his Word above all his name? Not only that, but most people don't realize that prior to Jesus's resurrection, Satan was the ruler of this earth. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness and took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time and told him that he would give it all to him if he would just bow down and confess and worship uh, Satan. But once Jesus obeyed and resurrected, the power shifted from Satan being the ruler of this earth to Jesus being the ruler of this earth. And this is a proof text because God hath highly exalted him. He's exalted above Satan now, 
and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So it doesn't matter what people think. <laughs> Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the God of all creation. And there isn't anything that was created without him. And one day, everybody will be made to understand this and every tongue will confess. Whether you deny it right now is irrelevant. You will eventually admit it. Let's see what the other perversions say. The ASV says, who existing in the form of God counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped. That just sounds confusing in and of itself. <laughs> it's hard to follow along with that. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. The NIV says, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The ESV says, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus was fully God. Jesus was fully man. The scripture says that he was tempted in every way that we were, yet without sin. That's Hebrews 4.12, or excuse me, 4.15. Um, he can relate to us because of he lived in this flesh. He was tempted. And the reason why he can save is because he is God. He has the power to defeat Satan. He has the power to defeat sin. And he has the power to defeat death. He rose victorious. Jesus is equal to God because Jesus is God. Jesus made himself of no reputation but made himself low. He made himself so low that he became a human. We are low. People think so highly of ourselves. The Bible says that we are less of a creation than the angels were. We're the lowest of God's creation. We think we're so good and we're so bad. We are low. He made himself low as one of us. Jesus also said in John 10, 18, that he has the power to lay his life down and that he has the power to raise it up again. Only him. And it's power that was given to him by the Father. All these new translations try to diminish the power of God and the power of Jesus being the same power. And this verse says it because it says in the true word of God that Jesus, being a form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He didn't think it was robbery to be equal to God because if he is God, all these new versions say that he did not consider equality with God a thing that he could grasp, a thing that he could make to his own advantage. He was God and he set it aside to where he could be tempted as man, but he was still fully God. Now you probably could say any one of these examples are enough of an example to show you that these versions of the Bible are perversions of the Bible. They're not true scripture. They've been tampered with and they change the doctrine. They change the deity of Jesus. And there are hundreds of them. <laughs> I'm not done with my examples, but there are hundreds of them. They're the, and they're all subtle. If you looked at them each individually, you could probably go, mm, that's really not enough to make that big of a difference. But when you study it out in its context and you see how it changes things, and here's the key I want you to think of. When you say, well, they're basically all the same thing, you should recognize that. Your brain is telling you that these have some something different in them but because your brain can't identify what that difference is, that, that disconnect signals you a thing that just says, well, they must be the same because of, I'm not smart enough to figure it out as, the, as I glance. And it's not you consciously it's doing that. It's what your brain tells you. It's what the signal it gives to you is that they're okay. They're the same. And the way you know it is because it uses the word basically. They're basically the same. Let's go back to that first point, the, the, the most important point that I said when we talked about setting the foundation for this study, things that are different are not the same. If God, if one word of God says that he, he thought it okay to be equal to God, he thought it not robbery to be equal to God, and every other version says something different, they're not the same. Think about this, Christian. Please, my heart pours out to you, and I'm not wanting to... This message isn't meant to come across as something to beat you up with. I want you to see it. I want your eyes to be descaled. I want you to have the blinders come off to where you can see this. 
The enemy is subtle. Subtlety is all it takes to deceive. Satan has had all the time in the world. He's been around. He's been a student of mankind and mankind's behavior. He's been around since before the earth was created. Satan has had all the time in the world to influence man and to slowly infiltrate God's word and to slowly infiltrate God's church to distort them, to change them, to make to take them off course. And it's taken him hundreds of years and he's been very patient. It's so subtle that you don't even notice. And it's that subtlety that is dangerous. You think that you have the words of God, but what and, and, and you think that because of you have the words of God, that you have hope in those words. But it's a false hope because you don't truly have the words of God. You may have some of the words of God. They're not all wrong because of then it wouldn't be subtle anymore. It'd be obvious. So you do have some truth in there. But the Bible says that one little measure of leaven is enough to leaven the whole lump. If you only change one word in, in God of God's word, is it God's word anymore? Think about it from the, the context of me giving you my word. If I say, I will do this, that's my word. I've told you I will do this. If you change one of those words, whether adding to or taking away from, is it still the same thing that I said? Is it still my word? Even if it's only one word change? And the answer is no, it's not. One word change is enough to make it not God's word. And there are hundreds of of these changes. I've shown you tons already. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you three more, which you may say that's a lot, <laughs> but I want you to see, and this is just three more examples of how they reduce the deity of Jesus Christ. There are hundreds of examples of how they attack Jesus, and it should make you mad because they're attacking Jesus, your Lord and Savior. Three more examples, and we'll move on. All right, let's go on ahead and pick up in Acts 7, verse 45, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. We're not going to dive into the context of this verse quite yet. Let's see what the other versions have to say before we, we jump in there. We'll start off with the New King James Version, which says, Which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. The NIV says, And after receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David. And the ESV says, Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nation that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David. Again, all new versions of the scripture, which aren't holy scriptures. I don't even think that they should be called scripture at all. They're, they're, books that imitate the Word of God. In all these imitations, they get this scripture wrong again. And this is another subtle way to diminish the deity of Jesus Christ. This scripture shows a clear picture that Jesus is God and that God drove them out. In fact, all three of these examples that I've given you in the perversions and all the other perversions say it too. They say that with Joshua, drove out the nation of God. So there's, they're, they're clarifying that God is the one who drove the inhabitants out. To give you some context, in this portion of Acts, this is Stephen who was selected by the, the council of Jews who were converted Christians to go to the Jews who were the group of Jews who were unbelieving Jews. They didn't believe in Jesus. To speak the truth to them, to, to offer the kingdom again, one last time. And Stephen gives them the gospel of Jesus Christ starting in the Old Testament and working all the way up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he did a beautiful job and they stoned him for it. They killed him because of just like they didn't like Jesus speaking truth, they didn't like Stephen speaking truth, and so they killed him. As he is going through and expounding through these different time periods that were spoken of in the Old Testament, He's, he's talking about when Moses died, Joshua uh, was leading the, the children of Israel into the promised land and was going to 
conquer the inhabitants of that land so that they could have it for a possession as it was promised in the covenant to Abraham. He's connecting dots for the children of Israel, for the Israeli leaders, for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the elders of the nation of Israel to be able to see that Jesus is God. And all these new translations take Jesus out of it and put Joshua in there. And they mess up a key reference as well. We're going to take a look in the book of Joshua, where this is actually the historical account of what's happening, show you what what the truth is <laughs> and how the, all these new scriptures get it wrong. Was Joshua the human who led the nation of Israel into the promised land? Yes. But there are many examples in their battles that the children of Israel didn't even draw their swords to fight in the battle. Jesus went before them and wiped out people before they even drew their swords. There were some battles they didn't even have to fight because God fought it for them. And because God was with them and it wasn't God the Father that was with them, it was God Jesus Christ. It was the same God Jesus who spoke to, to Moses in the burning bush and he, and he was with Joshua when he led the, the troops into war. Let's look at the book of uh, Joshua uh, to give you some context to this scripture. Moses has just passed away. Joshua was just anointed by God to lead his people and they have crossed the river. They've sent some spies over into Jericho. The spies have returned with the intel. Um, they've all gotten right, right with God because as they wandered 40 years in the desert, they didn't uh, practice the law of circumcision and they have all been circumcised. It says that there's a mound, a hill of, of the skin left over, which is crazy. They're about ready to start their first battle. It's the day before their first battle. And we pick up in Joshua 5, 13 uh, through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said to unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So the way that we know that that was the Lord is because the same context that it was with Moses. He spoke to Joshua just like he spoke to Moses. When Moses was listening to that burning bush, the burning bush told him to take off his shoes because where he stood was on holy ground. And what he told Joshua, his newly appointed servant, his new appointed leader, was to take off his shoes because where he stood was on holy ground. That was the Lord Jesus that won all those battles, that led, that led Joshua into this first battle, and when Stephen was recounting it in Acts, he said that they were brought in with Jesus because of the reason why he was conveying all this <laughs> to the Jews was so that they would believe in Jesus. Not so that they would believe in Joshua, because at the end of his, at the end of Stephen's account of all this stuff, he lets them know that they are the ones who killed their Messiah, that they crucified their Messiah. The context that he's talking about is Jesus Christ and the one true word of God, the King James Version. And it, listen, I'm not saying that there aren't other good Bibles in other languages. I haven't studied them out. I don't need to know them because I don't speak other languages. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the only word in English that is God's word is the King James Bible. And it doesn't have anything to do with the Texas Receptus. It doesn't have anything to do with any of that. God preserved his word. God preserved the translations. God did a miracle with this book. And the reason why we know it is because it doesn't take away from Jesus at all. It rightly states everything as it was meant to be from the word of God. All right, let's now look at the next way that they take away from Jesus and the new versions of the Bible by going to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, this is a passage about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaching his disciples how to pray. People call it the Lord's Prayer. The Lord actually never prayed this prayer. This was the Lord's teaching of the disciples how to pray. If you look at what the new translations do, all of them take this out. 
the new translation, or excuse me, the new living translation, the NLT says, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. That's where the verse 13 ends. The ESV says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's where the ESV ends. The NIV says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's where the NIV ends. The New King James Version has the footnote, the footnote of the NU text. That's what every footnote they have. They reference some other text other than what the King James Bible was based on. And yet they advertise that they based their version on the same manuscripts as the King James. And it's not true because of every footnote they have references different manuscripts than what the King James was based on. So they insert their little uh, in you text does not support from thine through amen being used. And you'll notice that's what every other version has missing too. It doesn't say for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Why omit this? This is a lesson where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. It's reducing Jesus' ability to teach. It's, teaching, it's saying that Jesus doesn't have the authority to do this, that he doesn't have the authority to teach. It's reducing his, his word. Why omit this important part of the prayer on how Jesus is teaching us how to pray? Who would want these, verse, th these words removed out of these verses? Was there something erroneous or errorous in this uh, text? Is there something that is called into question? Is Did Jesus say something controversial? No. He just said, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All 5,500 plus Byzantine texts support this verse being in their manuscripts. There's two, two texts of the Alexandrians 45 texts that say that this sh shouldn't be, that these this part of the verse shouldn't be in there. And so instead of trusting the 5,500 plus texts that all support it, because of the lies of Westcott and Hort, the modern Christian has turned and believed a lie. They have been deceived. And, and keep in mind, the Alexandrian texts are called the critical texts because they don't agree with each other. Just in the four books of the New Testament, they have over 3,000 discrepancies where they don't align with each other. Yet all 5,500 of the Byzantine texts agree with each other and they support each other and they say the same thing and this scripture is is included in it and again my faith isn't in the texas receptus my faith isn't in the 5500 Byzantine texts although i agree that those were what god used to get us to this they were part of the purification process if you will they were part of god's will but i firmly believe that this version is inspired, is in translated, is preserved by God. So what the scholars say is because the English language has migrated, we need to update it because of that old book is outdated. But the truth is, is that God wrote it by his divine inspiration and preservation in the Elizabethan English, and it is still relevant today. Do we have to study it out to see what it means? Yes, we do. But that's part... Listen... To go to college to get understanding of any subject, it doesn't matter what it is, you still have to study. There's no difference from this word. You still have to study. You still have to read it. This is the last example that we're going to use to, to show the way the new versions reduce the deity of Jesus Christ through changing the word of God. And uh, I'm going to read from Luke 4. Uh, verse 1 through 8. The verses that we're calling into question in the New Translations are verse 4 and verse 7. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, again, this is calling doubt to the the word, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, 
all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. If we look at the ESV version, it says in verse 4, And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone takes out, but by every word of God. And in verse 8, it says, And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Well, who was God talking to? Wasn't he talking to Satan? Didn't he say, Get thee behind me, Satan? And they left that out, too. So they left out, By every word of God, and get thee behind me, Satan. And honestly, every new version of the Bible does this. The NIV says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And the NIV inserts a little footnote there that says, referring to uh, Deuteronomy 8.3. That is a scripture that Jesus is quoting to Satan when he says this. And yet, if you look at the NIV reference and you go to Deuteronomy 8.3 in the NIV, it says that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So there's no excuse why they chose to omit the scripture. The NIV is quoting, they understand that Jesus, when he was being tempted of Satan, was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. And in Deuteronomy 8.3, their scripture says, their, their perverted word says, man cannot live on bread alone, but by, by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So they knew the correct scripture. They just choose not to do it. And every other version does the same thing. Their response, in, the NIV's response in verse 8 says, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, it doesn't say anything about uh, get thee behind me, Satan. And then we'll take a look at the NASB 20, which is the uh, New American Standard Bible uh, 2020 edition. Uh, so this was a recently updated version. Uh, it says, And Jesus answered him, It is written, and then they like to use these capital shouty letters you'll see on the screen here. Man shall not live on bread alone. Doesn't say anything about the Word of God, though. And then it also says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But it doesn't say anything about get thee behind me, Satan. In a passage where Satan is tempting Christ, and it's right at the beginning of his earthly ministry, and these perversions are taking God's words, Jesus' words, out of his own mouth and, and omitting them, I hope I don't need to have to expound on how this is an issue. <laughs> Why do they need to take these things out? Why does every major version or all, excuse me, why does all new versions of the Bible do this? Why do they all omit this scripture? How they are diminishing the word of God in this passage? Well, in, in what they say, just on their very premise, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What is the words that proceed out of the mouth of God? That's Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. And here, they're saying that men will die without the word of God. I mean, essentially, if you think about it, man shall not live by bread alone. That means men's going to die. And men will die, except they get the word of God. That's the only way men can live. And by taking away that word, they take away the very way that we can live. And the only way that we can live is through Jesus. It's only through Jesus that we get life. The Bible also says in Matthew that, and in all the Gospels, that narrow is the way that leads unto life. Broad is the path that leadeth unto destruction, but narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. Jesus also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this also says that no man can live on bread alone, but by the words of God. The words of God are the bread of life, Jesus. And they diminish him by taking it out. And they diminish our ability to know who our Creator is and to know our God, even more by understanding that he is the word by screwing this whole thing up and misquoting it. It's really, it's sad. And, and I hope that this, I hope that these examples that I've given you of how the Bible diminishes Jesus is enough to convict you, enough to, to open your eyes, to help you soften your heart. And again, don't just take my word for it. Study this stuff out. There's all kinds of lies out there. You've got to guard yourself. There's the, the enemy has been at work for a long time, and he's put tons of false information out there. But I've given you from the Word of God how these new perversions reduce the deity of Jesus, and that in and of itself, any one of those examples should be enough to say this is a false Word of God. And the only one who doesn't do it is the King James Bible. 
that's all we had time for this week. I hope this was a good study for you. I hope that you're growing in the Lord. I hope that you're seeing uh, how these different versions of the Bible pervert and distort the true word of God and thereby making differences that we really should be conscious of and we really should avoid. <laughs> they're, they're giving us false doctrine. They're giving us uh, a reduced picture of the deity of Christ. Next week, we're gonna be looking at a whole different side of this. We're gonna be looking at the actual errors that the new translations have in them, and they all have these errors. This is a great building block on the fact that we've already seen that there's disconnects in doctrine, that they reduce the Lord Jesus, and now we're gonna see that there's absolute errors in them, further disproving their ability to be the authoritative word of God because God cannot have error. God is without error. It's gonna be a great study. I hope you join us. That's what was up this week. I hope to see you next week in this word.